Hello, and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Barton Beebe, John M. Damaris Professor of Intellectual Property Law at New York University School of Law. We will discuss his open source trademark case book and the open source movement in general. So welcome to the podcast, Barton. Thanks. I'm really happy to be here. Great. So um, as you know, I'm going to be teaching trademark law for the first time this summer, and I'm really excited to be using your your casebook, which I really like. And I especially like the fact that it's open source because I personally only use open source casebooks in all of my classes. Yeah. But but I was hoping we could start by you just you know talking about what it means for a casebook to be open source. Like when we say it's an open source casebook, what are we talking about? Does that always mean the same thing? Um, you know, what makes a casebook open source? Sure. So I use the term open source very loosely, and I think that uh, people who are familiar with the term from the computing world might sort of. Uh, have a sort of a problem with my use of the term open source because it's it has a pretty specific technical meaning in that area. But I think it's okay. I'd like to think it's okay to bring it over into law uh, and apply it to casebooks just to emphasize that the casebook is um, entirely free. That is to say, like no charge at all for the download of the casebook or the use of the casebook or reproduction of the casebook. And um, furthermore, the casebook is provided in some format that is easily um adaptable by the student or uh, an instructor uh, so that the casebook can be changed in, in uh, whatever way is appropriate for the particular course. So it's sort of the idea that it's not just available in PDF, but also in, uh, in my case, in the doc formats, uh, which regrettably then refers to Microsoft's uh, software, which is not open source. Um, but uh, even better, it would be available in like the open office format or something like that, so that anyone can uh, download it and copy and paste from it or do whatever they uh, want with it. Um, a little more uh, towards the uh, specifics of my casebook, I released it under a Creative Commons license, the attribution non-commercial share alike uh, license. And uh, again, um, those who are really tuned in to the uh, precise meaning of open source in the computing world might say, well, look, there's some inconsistencies uh, between uh, my use of the term open source and my Creative Commons uh, license. And I, I agree. Um, but I was just trying to express that the book is uh, free for use and freely adaptable. Um, and uh, I wanted to sort of, I don't know, adapt the term open source for that purpose. So maybe you could talk a little bit about those Creative Commons uh, licenses and the different kinds of options that might be available to people. Because I'm not sure that necessarily all law professors or maybe listeners who aren't in kind of the IP sphere are as familiar necessarily with, with yeah, Creative Commons and how it works. So the Creative Commons um, movement, I think it's it's fair to call it that, has been around for maybe two decades now. Uh, really maybe 15 years. Um, and in essence, the Creative Commons license uh, works from the background assumption that you are retaining the copyright in your work. And essentially says, uh, like speaking for myself, I am claiming copyright protection in my casebook, uh, but I am uh, issuing a general license to the world that limits my rights and allows people to do various things uh, with my copyrighted material. So one thing to realize from the start is that the use of the Creative Commons license does not mean that you are somehow renouncing your copyright uh, or adjuring copyright forever in, in some way. That's not at all the case. In fact, it's based on a maintenance of copyright uh, protection. Uh, by the way, someone entirely new to intellectual property might say, well, wait a minute, do I have to register at the, at the copyright office in order to uh, claim copyright rights in the General answer is no. We have a recent Supreme Court case that says if you want to sue somebody, you got to actually go and register your thing. But just to claim rights, uh, there's no need to, to register your copyright. So the Creative Commons license that I've chosen is a fairly standard uh, license. I think on the CC website, 
Creative Commons websites, you can get their data about the kinds of licenses that most people tend to prefer. But what I care about is not so much, you know, making money off of this, but attribution. Uh, having put the work into the casebook, um, I do selfishly want my name to be associated with it. Um, and so the license requires that whenever the casebook is republished or redistributed uh, or printed out, that uh, my name appear somewhere uh, on the on the casebook. And then uh, that's the attribution portion of the license. The non-commercial portion of the license just says that uh, if you reprint this thing, you can't sell it to someone for profit. Um, and then share alike is uh, sometimes referred to, and Brian, you, you can help. It's, I think it's like, basically it's like a viral sort of license uh, in the sense that if some other user adapts my casebook um, and creates what in copyright law we call a derivative work from my casebook, that other user, that second user, uh, must distribute their adaptation under the same license under which I've uh, been distributing my casebook. So the virality is established, the license uh, extends through any adaptations from my casebook. Now, for Creative Commons, it's important to realize you can go on the website, you click a few boxes and you get this license. It's very easy to use. Mm. Yeah, you know, and that virality actually is really kind of directly borrowed from the open source software exactly. too, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, that's definitely takes – Creative Commons takes inspiration from the open source uh, sensibility, open source movement, um, and the virality is definitely part of that. So you've, you've talked a little bit about the terms on which you make your – uh, your casebook available. I wonder if you could talk a little bit as well about the mechanics mm -hmm. of how you actually make it available yeah. as well as sort of what other people you've seen do. So like what are people's options if they want to consider going the open source route? Yeah. So the uh, when I began the project, my expectation was uh, to create a, a Word document um, that would be the entire casebook, or initially it was a series of Word documents for each part of the casebook. I think there were four or five uh, separate Word documents. And I would just post them online on my personal website, bartonbb.com. Um, and then I got a little more ambitious and I thought, well, let's create a website for the casebook itself. And that cost maybe, I, I bought the domain name for like, I don't know, 10 bucks, uh, tmcasebook.org. And then running the website, I think maybe costs 50 bucks a year or something like that. It's very inexpensive. Um, and then I used uh, WordPress, which is another um, uh, free to use um, um, package of, I don't know, I guess you'd call it a package of software uh, to create uh, my website. But I should emphasize that um, for law school faculty members who have like a web page through their law school, um, it's usually really straightforward just to post your casebook. If it's in like a doc file or you turn it into a PDF, just post it online on your on your uh, faculty website. Uh, you, there, I don't know if there's really a need to create like a fancy freestanding uh, website, but if you want to do that, then it turns out that's not that uh, difficult to do uh, either. Uh, but one last thing on this, it's it turns out, you know, um, words uh, on modern, on like a good laptop nowadays, um, you can load your entire casebook into a Word file. I, forget, I think it's like 30 megabytes. And it's just not a problem for contemporary laptops to deal with that file size. And then it's really uh, easy to work with the full file and search and replace and all that stuff. So I've also seen some platforms that people have started that are intended for like kind of hosting casebooks and really other forms of academic content yeah. as well. I'm thinking like, you know, Cali has some stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then I think Ted Sickleman started yes. or was participated in La Carta. Yeah. Ha have you thought about using one of those platforms? And do you think there are like trade-offs or advantages or disadvantages to doing it on your own website versus using a platform like yeah. that? So I've actually used La Carta um, and it's it's been great to work with them. Uh, they will print out a um, you know paper version of the book in some sort of nicely bound edition, um, and otherwise they you they post the, your casebook to their website and have various uh, methods by which a student can you know highlight the text and add notes to the text. And I think there's also features that allow students to comment on the text in in ways that can be shared with their classmates. So there's a lot of different functionality on La Carta. Um, 
Similarly, Semifor Press is another um, sort of platform that uh, where you can make available uh, free case books. Or I think on Semifor Press, as on La Carta, you can charge you know whatever price you want. It's basically an alternative to um, the mainstream. Uh, presses that are charging, you know, like 200, 250 bucks for a casebook, which is just insane. It's absolutely uh, revolting. And Semaphore is like a nice uh, alternative to that. If you want to charge 10 bucks for your casebook or 50 bucks or whatever, I think you have that option as as you do also on La Carta. There's also H2O uh, Classroom, I think, with Harvard Law School. Uh, they, I, I was using them at first. I haven't updated my casebook on their website, but there, there again is another platform. So there are a bunch of different options. Um, and finally you can, you know, you can self print your casebook on Amazon. That's what I do. I think, um, like the Lemley Merges Manel IP survey book is now, I think they make it available through the Amazon, Amazon print, uh, system. And that's pretty easy to work with. And you can set whatever price you want. In my case, I just sell it at cost. Uh, but you can also charge like a royalty of whatever you want per uh, per casebook. Yeah, very cool. Um, so I, I was wondering, and you've kind of alluded to this in in, in our already, but sort of why open source? Yeah. Like, why should law professors producing casebooks, writing casebooks, why should they consider open source options rather than a commercial publisher? And if there are law professors who you know, want to generate some sort of return or revenue from the casebook they produce, as opposed to distributing it for free, yeah. sort of why why might they consider an open source or quasi open source option rather than a, conserv- a sure. commercial publisher? So there are a bunch of reasons. Um, the one that really motivated me to start uh, was that the prices being charged by the traditional presses for law school casebooks are just criminal, uh, especially given the fact that these casebooks contain you know, 80, 85, even 90% public domain material. That is like court opinions. Um, so it's outrageous uh, that the, the prices are so high. Um, and it's nice to be able to then, you know, present to students um, like a zero cost case book or whatever, if you want to charge 10, 20 bucks or more, but certainly not something that's that's 200 bucks. Given law school tuition um, and and the debt load for students, I mean, this is this is a drop in the bucket, but at least it's it seems like it, at the very least, a nice gesture uh, to offer uh, low cost uh, case books. But even setting that aside, another reason uh, to make your own case book in an open source model, or at least make your own casebook and post it online, is that it's so much easier to adapt the casebook or to amend or, or edit the casebook over time. If you're working with a conventional press, you know, they've got to print the thing out and there's all sorts of delays. But when I update my casebook, I just post it online and it, you know, it takes like uh, 10 seconds to upload and there's the new version. Uh, it's so easy to do that one thing you got to discipline yourself with is not to, to fuss over it like every month with <laughs> monthly updates. You just maybe update it once a year or once a semester um, and resist the temptation to keep, you know, uh, tinkering with it uh, every uh, every week. So it's uh, first you can charge your own your own price. Um, or no price. Uh, second, it's very easy to uh, edit uh, the thing. Third, it's really easy to distribute. Um, I think that uh, people are more prone to adopt your casebook if, like, it's one week before the semester, and oh my God, they forgot to submit their order for the physical casebooks. It's really easy just to tell the students, "There it is. It's online." Um, <laughs> so, um, and. Um, so there's all the transaction costs uh, are severely minimized in a way that I think will encourage others to adopt your casebook. In my particular case, there's a fantastic uh, trademark casebook of, uh, published by um, two law professors who are very knowledgeable about uh, trademark law. Um, regrettably, I think their situation is that they they don't they didn't retain copyright. And so they can't just sort of go off and make their own version. And um, this, um, so I think when people are choosing between that case book and mine, uh, mine has a, uh, some advantage in just the fact that it's free and easy to access. 
so I don't have any illusions about the comparative quality. I think the, a big part of why it's gotten a large number of adopters is that it's just free and super easy to uh, to get to. So there are a bunch of different reasons, I think, to go with basically self-publishing and then open sources or whatever low cost uh, without digital rights management attached to the book. Um, uh, all recommend sort of uh, writing your own book. If I could say one other final thing, 20 years ago, it would have made no sense to do this. Uh, but now with the technology, things have changed so much. The With ability to post online so easily and with word processing software so much more powerful than it was 20 years ago, uh, I think the technology too is just really caught up with the, with the dream of this. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting to me how conventions in legal scholarship are so sticky that they they lag technological change yeah. really significantly kind of across across mm -hmm. the board. I mean, it goes with legal scholarship as well. And, and I was wondering, so uh, you mentioned earlier Semaphore Press, and I've seen that as an, an interesting model, at least in part because, well, I mean, I used the uh, Lauren and Miller uh -huh. uh, IP casebook off Semaphore yeah. Press, which which I like quite a bit. And um, they have a pay what you wish, okay, model, great. Like, a share, yeah. like a shareware yeah, model, and yeah. they have a have a suggested price yeah. of thirty dollars. And I, I wonder for for authors who may be contemplating how to approach these questions, who might be interested in generating revenue. Do you have any sense of what the sort of relative revenue generation possibilities from an author's perspective are yeah. with a kind of a low price or shareware price yeah. casebook as opposed to a commercial casebook from, from the from the author's perspective. Yeah, sure. I wish I, it'd be so cool to see like the curves and all of this, the supply and demand curves. Are, but um, my sense is like um, that those who have left the traditional publishing mode and gone into what I'll just keep calling it self-publishing, um, and who charge some, you know, modest fee, I think they actually walk away making more because the royalties from the traditional books are so low um, that um, if you charge 30 bucks uh, a book for your self-published book, it may be that you'll actually profit more if you want to follow that model. Um, and then, you know, if you charge 10 bucks, maybe you'll get more uh, adoptions and less copyright infringement from students who just make a copy for their friends. Um, and if you go with the pay what you want model or what you can model there too, uh, maybe you, you get less infringement and a little more in royalties. Uh, but in general, my answer to your question is that those who self-publish and charge tend to at least make the, what they would have with the traditional presses, if not uh, a bit more. Yeah, that's definitely been my experience. I mean, I I pull my students every year on it, and for the thirty dollars suggested price is very sticky yeah. for for the students. Yeah. Um, the sort of the mean is typically around twenty five dollars uh -huh. that they pay, and and the median is thirty. Okay. Like the bulk of them pay the suggested price, which I always thought was that's really cool. interesting. Yeah. So uh, I know that some authors, you know, or some potential casebook authors might also feel like there's a certain um, prestige yeah. element still yeah. uh, associated yeah. with, you know, publishing with a traditional totally. press as opposed to, you know, self-publishing, which still has yeah. kind of a stigma, yeah. even though it really shouldn't, in my opinion. Um, uh, how should people think about that? Are there ways of changing that? You know, and how, I mean, how is the open source movement in casebook publishing sort of tackling that problem? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. It's something I thought about myself and I didn't really try to do this until, I don't know, it was a little farther along um, and, you know, tenured or whatever and, and um, sort of had taught trademark law a bunch of times Um and so, and I still thought, oh, this is self-publishing. That's weird. Are, are people going to think that's weird? Am I going to get any credit for this uh, from my institution or in the field? And um, I think my institution, I'm not sure law schools really care about if you're publishing a casebook anyway, but uh, mm. still though, there's something, maybe there's something nice about the certification that comes with one of the traditional presses. But that's one reason why on my website, I felt it necessary to list out every, all the adopters of the casebook. I wanted to admit, you know, I've, as time has passed, I've, I've been less careful making sure I list every adopter. Like I'm sure I'm missing at least, you know, 10 other adopters, but I think I've got like 45 
40 or 45 law schools listed there. And that was just to try to emphasize that even though this is some goofy self-published thing, it's actually being used, you know, by all these law schools. Wow. So I think wow. that's one effective way to um, to get over that, uh, that bias against uh, self-published books is to somewhere online make clear who's using the book. Um, and over time, I guess that can build a reputation for the book. And as more of these self-published books uh, start coming out and maybe start, um, as the people start realizing that they're being used more and more, I think the stigma uh, associated with self-publishing will, uh, will go away. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic that so many, so many professors have adopted your casebook. And just to emphasize how important this is, I was wondering if you could kind of just guesstimate as to how much money you're collectively saving students. Every yeah. Year. So I've wondered about that. I don't keep any numbers on a uh, number of downloads or class sizes or any of that stuff. And it's maybe that's as a matter of principle, but really it's because I'm just too lazy to figure out how to, uh, to do it and um and run all the the numbers but i i guess like just offhand now let's say it's 45 uh loss law schools per year uh using the casebook with an average of 40 students per class or something like that maybe conservatively let's say 30 students per class uh, i'm just doing the calculator here it's that's 1350 uh editions sold and let's say i sold it for 30 bucks each it's not a lot. It's forty thousand um, bucks per year. Uh, that's for 40, uh, 45 classrooms per year, um, mm -hmm. assuming thirty students in a classroom, uh, and at thirty dollars. If it were, yeah. um, you know, uh, sold at a traditional uh, price, let's say um, two two hundred dollars per book, students would be spending two hundred seventy thousand dollars per year. So. That's a pretty, yeah. pretty big difference. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of amazing to me. And one of the things that was really motivating to me about doing that. So what, one thing I've noticed is that, you know, of the open source case books out there, a substantial plurality seem to be in or adjacent to the intellectual yeah. property field. Yeah. I wonder if you have thoughts about why that yeah. is. I think it's because, uh, and, uh, and I don't think it's any big revelation. The IP professors are much more familiar with, you know, the copyright regime, and are much more careful about signing away their copyrights, uh, their their copyright rights in what they uh, produce. Uh, they're also just aware that you know, there's no need to register at the copyright office to claim copyright protection. They're also familiar with the Creative Commons license. They tend to be uh, more technologically sort of, I don't know. Um, um, farther along, whatever. So they know how to create a website. It turns out, you know, you can go on Google and type in, how do I create a website? And you just follow the instructions. It's not that hard. Um, but we, we know that it's not that hard. And so all of those factors combined, I think, um, and also we, we there's an ethic of like, uh, among law professors in the intellectual property space of the public domain um, and mm -hmm. of free culture. Um, and, um I think, too, maybe there's even a tradition where maybe we're just sort of more in touch with the tradition of uh, educational textbooks, if possible, should be free or low cost, you know. Um, mm. So all of those things together, uh, I think, contribute to uh, a lot of IP people uh, doing this. And we finally, we know about open source software. And so we're inspired by the example of the open source movement and sensibility and, and want to bring it into our own. Uh, world. So I was wondering if you could shift as well and talk a little bit about your thoughts on casebook um, writing yeah. and, and construction. Yeah. So, you know, just to begin with, it's really common for people to collaborate and sometimes have many authors yeah. on casebooks. You wrote yours by, by yourself. Yeah. I was wondering if you could talk about that decision, what the experience was like and sort of what the upsides and downsides, because, you know, it's a really substantial book. I mean, it's like 800 yeah. pages long. It must have been yeah. a, a huge yeah. amount of work. Yeah. So it's, um, I should say, like, yeah, I've done this myself. My colleagues here at NYU, Chris Sprigman and Jeannie Frommer, are bringing out a copyright casebook uh, that that um, is currently being Chris Bacafusco at Cardozo is currently teaching from it, 
And uh, Chris and Chris Brigman and Jeannie will release this book in a couple of months and they're co-writing it. And I, I, you know, sort of, I've been watching them do it and it's like, oh my God, they're saving so much time and work because they're, they're splitting it between the two of them. I, I wrote the thing entirely myself, partially because it's, there are, you know, there are lots of uh, transaction costs that come with co-writing. And I thought, um, I sort of wanted total creative control over the thing, uh, if you can call it creative. But in any case, I, I wanted just to, to do it all myself so that I wouldn't have to um, compromise on anything. But that, that's def, definitely for better and for worse. Like um, what I thought, uh, what I dr- sort of dreamed would happen, which is pretty much what has happened, is that a lot of the people who are using the casebook have been very generous in sending in comments and suggestions. I think part of doing it for free is that it sets a different tone. Like even $10 or 30 bucks is one thing, but when you're doing it totally for free, people I think respond to the book a bit differently and are really generous in trying to help make the book better. It's like, it becomes like a community um, effort. And so I often feel like I'm just sort of the central repository for all these suggestions and I just collate them and put them into the uh, next edition of the book. Um, Again, doing it yourself though, the the basic process is um, it turns out writing out the rough draft where there's not a lot of apparatus, uh, it's just all the edited versions of the cases. If you've taught the class two or three times, you already know what the usual suspects are for the cases. Editing them down is not that hard. And if you teach from it for one semester with your students, um, that's a great sort of test run uh, for the basic structure of the casebook. Then maybe one more edition where you start adding in the, the textual apparatus introduction and all of that stuff. It turns out uh, at some point, yeah, the book will become sort of uh, big and thick. But my book, it took like four or five years until it's reached the, the state it's in uh, now. Yeah, so I was wondering if you could talk about that. So, you know, you've taught these classes for a long time. You have a lot of experience as a teacher. You know, I assume, imagine using, you know, lots of different casebooks in the past to yeah. teach from. Like, how how did that inform your decisions about what to include in your yeah. casebook and sort of how to frame what you were doing and sort of the structure of the book that you created. Yeah. So I guess a couple of things that I wanted in my casebook, and again, here it's a matter of taste and and um, different people would want to have different things in their casebook, but I wanted it to be sort of, um, I don't know, minimal in some ways, like a limited number of, of notes at the end. Regrettably, as you know, the years have passed and this happens with every casebook, it sort of gets a little bloated because it's hard to delete out stuff because you're worried that users might be relying on some stuff you want to delete out. But um, one thing is that I wanted minimal uh, notes. And if, if, a question, if the casebook asked students a question, I actually adopted the policy where basically I wanted the answer to be somewhere in the casebook. So it wasn't something where they'd have to look it up on uh, Westlaw or uh, wait until class. And I realized that's controversial. Like others might say, no, you've, they got to come into class with an answer to that question. You shouldn't just sort of uh, feed them the answer. But my approach was different. So I just wanted um, the casebook to be sort of transparent, not really hide the ball. Um, I also wanted it to be like a semi, uh, treatise, uh, and definitely it's not that yet, but I, my, my hope was like the casebook would actually set out the basic black letter law. There would be nothing hidden. The student wouldn't have to use a commercial outline to actually learn what the law was or is, um, and would basically get the, the basic rules of trademark law. And then all the little details after those rules would be what, uh, could be talked about in class or the could be problematized, but there'd be no sense in which even the basic stuff the student would leave, you know, the, the classroom that day or the end of the semester studying for the exam thinking, wait a minute, what is the black letter doctrine? I wanted the case book to convey that just really clearly so that that was just the foundation for actually studying all the sort of details and problems with that black letter uh, doctrine. Yeah, no, I, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I've definitely tried to take the same approach myself. Um, I was wondering if you could, ha- you could kind of give your thoughts on case selection yeah. as yeah. well, because, you know, looking, through, looking through your case book, a lot of the cases are real familiar, kind of the old standards that, you know, you, you would, 
expect to see in any trademark class. But there's others that you know are are yeah. unfamiliar, and I was wondering if you could talk about that. And like when you're, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, some of those are obvious that you're going to put in. Are there ones? Are there obvious cases that you felt like you wanted to leave out for yeah. some reason? And when you chose to put in things that are less usual, like why did you pick those particular cases? Are there things that make for a good casebook yeah. case in yeah. your opinion? So the um, I figured like the casebook and. It's like I have no great insight on this. I've, I've only done this for five years, and, and others would know much more. But I guess I started think started with the thought that some cases are in there because they're Supreme Court cases, and everyone else knows about them. Um, and often they're really important uh, Supreme Court cases. Other cases I wanted to put in because they're just totally wrong and insane, you know. Um, and other cases I put in because they're just really well done and uh, really this is a really good analysis. And uh, sometimes there'll be like an insane case right next to a really good one. And the question presented at the beginning of the cases is like, which one's better? And hopefully the student will come to the right conclusion and recognize the insane one. Uh, and this is so that students, uh, when they're reading the federal court opinions, um, are sort of um, realize that, you know, these courts are, are doing the best they can, but they're not always getting it right. Um, and it's important to read with a skeptical eye and read not with the perspective of, okay, I'm reading this, this opinion to try to get out, figure out what the rule is. No, no, I already know what the rule is. Now I'm reading the opinion to figure out whether this court has applied the rule properly or exposed some problem with the rule or just got everything totally uh, wrong. So often it was the insane cases, like little squib cases. And again, the case book can be criticized for sometimes putting in a bunch of little tiny excerpts from cases, but I wanted to give, give the students a broad exposure to, a, you know, a constellation of cases in some situations. Some of them might be totally wrong uh, and no one else has heard of them, but I thought it'd be nice to give a, a bunch of examples. Yeah, no, I agree. And I actually think it's really important for students to realize that just because a court says something doesn't mean yeah, it's exactly. right. Oh, it's so important. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so Barton, in, in closing, I wonder if you could, if we could like return to the open source issue and sort of ask, you know, in your opinion, like what are things we can do to not only encourage professors who are thinking about writing case books to go an open source route, but to encourage professors who are assigning yeah. case books to look for and prioritize uh, open source case books. And, you know, to what extent is this like the future yeah. of legal pedagogy publishing? I mean, can open source outcompete? Should it outcompete? Why hasn't yeah. it outcompeted commercial publishing yeah. under the circumstances? So I think the um, as far as as uh, getting uh, law professors to write in this mode or adopt books written in this mode, I think it's uh, may might be sort of on the IP faculty at the various law schools to spread the good news, you know, that um, that these books exist, that this model of publishing exists, that it's actually not that hard to do. It might even be easier to do than publishing with the commercial uh, publishers. Um, and so it's, and we're at every law school. And so it's just a matter of spreading the news to our colleagues, which uh, the IP group here at NYU has, has tried to do with modest success, uh, maybe not at all, but in any case, we're still working on it. Um, as far as getting these things adopted, it's weird. I think law professors, uh, it's not weird. Uh, law professors um, tend to be like insensitive to how expensive these books are. Like sometimes they'll be assigning a case book and they don't even know what the students are paying for it. And they'll express shock that the price is $250, you know. Um, and so maybe just sensitizing law professors to how expensive that is and how criminal it is for the sort of monopoly rights to reach this level of expense, um, that could, professors should be made uh, aware of that. I do think ultimately the, this model will, uh, will outcompete the commercial publishers. Uh, I've worked with a commercial publisher once, and I was really shocked to realize that basically they were just a photocopy shop. I mean, they, we did all the formatting. We did all the proofreading and sent in the book. Uh, they printed it out, distributed it. That was expensive. But then they charged 200 bucks for it. And I think our royalties were 10 bucks or something. I mean, it was insane, you know? And so um, 
that's that really did it for me. I was like, you've got to be kidding. I'm basically doing all the work. And because I'm a naive academic, um, I'm agreeing to this. And it's like, no way. Uh, I'm never doing this again. So um, mm. I think all of these factors uh, mean that over time, uh, open source will prevail. Finally, one would like to see a, um, a model adopted in the universities where, um, and this is a dream way down the road, where to be considered as part of one's tenure file only works that are published under some, uh, under some sort of open model uh, will be considered. So if something is behind a paywall, it will not be considered for tenure. I think that's, that's consistent with the tradition of academics in the West going back 2,000 years um, and we just haven't caught up with that um, in general. So establishing that ethic would be spectacular, but I think it's it's a long way from from happening. Yeah, well, from from your lips to God's yeah. ears, man, that's like I couldn't I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> awesome. Well, well, Barton, thank you so much. This has been incredibly illuminating, and I really hope we can convince more people to go the open yeah, source. Yeah, well, thanks route. for for casting light on my my book and uh, featuring it, and um, and good, best of luck with the the, the future of uh, these these podcasts. Snap! What a happy sound! Snap is the happiest sound I've found. You may clap, rap, tap, slap, but snap makes the world go round. Snap! Crackle, pop, Rice Krispies. I say it's crackle, the crispy sound. You gotta have crackle or the clock's not wound. Geese crackle, feathers tickle, belts buckle, beats pickle, but crackle makes the world go round. Snap! Crackle, pop, pop, Rice Krispies. Now I insist that pops the sound The best is missed unless pops around You can't stop hopping when the cereal's popping Pop makes the world go round Snap, crackle, pop, rice krispies Snap, you crackle, the pop is the sound You dab the heads and crackle as the pop's not round Make clap, crackle, rap, and then the cereal's popping Snap, crackle, pop makes the world go round Kellogg's best to you